Well, keep your Bibles open, please, uh, to Acts chapter 9. And we're back in the book of Acts for a a, a little while now uh, before we start into the Christmas season in about six weeks' time. And yes, I did just say the words Christmas and season and six weeks in the same sentence. It's rolling on, isn't it? And it may have seemed, I guess, a little bit of a strange place to jump back into the book of Acts. Um, why are we looking at this little small story of uh, a healing and a resurrection? It's a strange place to get back into it, maybe. But chapter 9, verse 31, that was a really good place to break off last time, and a good place actually to come back into. Look at verse 31. It's quite a significant verse. This is how the last section ended. We've got uh, Saul has been converted. He's now a leading apostle. Instead of organizing the persecution of the church, he is now preaching for the church to build her up. And so verse 31 says, the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. As I say, that's a a significant verse, a significant line in the sand, if you like. The great commission that Jesus had given to his disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, was to be his witnesses in all the lands of Israel. So from Jerusalem through all of Judea, Samaria, and then on to the ends of the earth. And so by chapter 9, verse 31... We've seen the gospel of Jesus in the hands of his holy apostles and and with this vibrant, vital church that's really living out their faith publicly. The church is growing. They are indeed witnessing to Jesus as he commanded. And look at where this witness had reached. Luke, the guy who wrote this account, says in verse 31 that the witness has reached Jerusalem. The witness has reached all the lands of Judea and Samaria. And so now, of course, we're expecting the work of the gospel in the hands of the church to to go further afield to the ends of the earth. And indeed, that is where we're seeing it going. So you see why it's an important moment just to mark that. The rest of the book of Acts will predominantly follow uh, the, the progress of the Apostle Paul on his journeys to the ends of the earth. He, he's the primary impo- apostle who is engaging the Gentiles. But we're not done yet with Peter and the Jerusalem church. Peter is going to be the leading voice, really, as the church begins to deal with the question of its unity in Christ. Because as there's going to be a great influx of Gentiles coming into the church, a church which was at the time made up of a majority of Jewish Christians, the questions of unity are going to be, have to be dealt with. How do we deal with the various customs, the Jewish customs we have now that we've got so many Gentiles in our presence? And Peter's going to have a significant role to play in those discussions. This little section follows Peter as he goes about just encouraging some churches. He is heading north towards Caesarea to, uh, to, to start to witness to the Gentile peoples up there. And some of those questions of unity are, are going to begin to come to the surface. And, and, and next week we're going to see a really big, significant moment in that progress. But right now he's, he's on the way to Caesarea and he's visiting various churches that he will see on his route. Verse 32, we read that Peter's going here and there on these trips. I like that. It's just, he, Peter's just going here and there. And it's like now we're actually joining him as a passenger in his trip up to Caesarea. So they leave Jerusalem. They go down to the saints at Lydda. And it, and it is down, it's downhill. Jerusalem's up in the hills and they're coming down into, into the plains towards the coast, uh, the plains of Sharon, this great big area of the coast down the hill from Jerusalem. And Lydda was 
was one of the provincial capitals. It was like 10 regional capitals in Judea. So Lydda had a, a reasonably important place in Judea. Now, it's likely that Lydda had already been visited by Philip the Evangelist. Uh, Philip also went up to Caesarea, and uh, Philip would have taken this same route. This is like how you get there. This is the A1, if you like, up north to Caesarea. This is the route he would have taken. So it's, it's possible that the reason that there's a church already here is because Philip has visited, but it's only 25, 30 miles or so from Jerusalem, so it's not an unreasonable also to assume that some of the Christians from Jerusalem have moved out, perhaps during the time of persecution. So there's a church there. So Peter rocks up in Lydda. And he finds this guy, verse 33, called Aeneas, who was paralyzed, bedridden for eight years. And I love just how brief and how matter of fact the account is right here. Verse 34, Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose. And that's it. That's all it says. But of course, the fact that Peter so blatantly points to Jesus as the source of the healing, as the one who actually does the work of healing here, is no coincidence. Jesus Christ is alive, and he is at work through his apostles. The church is witnessing to him just as they were commanded. And through the apostles in particular, there are works of, of Jesus which were just like the sorts of things that Jesus did before. They're really showing these actions that Jesus is not dead. He is living and he is active and he is with his church. And this particular healing is so reminiscent of, of one of the, the healings that Jesus performed when he came across a paralytic in Luke chapter 5. There was a word of command to heal him, and then he says, take up your mat, roll up your bed, make your bed. That's what that's about. It's very Jesus-like, isn't it? And so it's all pointing to Christ. Now, the miracles of Jesus were usually done, yes, out, out of compassion, but, but primarily they were done to authenticate all that he was saying about himself and all that he was and was, was capable of doing. And so again, here, with Peter healing Aeneas, the apostolic preaching and teaching is being authenticated through the miracles and the works of the apostles. See, the resurrection of Jesus was, was like the, the, the linchpin, the fulcrum of the apostles' preaching. Every sermon, every address that we've got recorded in Acts, you, you kind of see that it's either the heart of the message or that's the thing that got the crowd going. It was the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, which always sparked things off. And, and what better to testify to the fact that Jesus is alive and still active than to see the kinds of works he was doing continuing. It's an amazing testimony. So Peter preaches and he goes around and he heals in Jesus' name. And the news of this spreads around town, as you'd imagine. This Christianity, this everything they're saying, it's the real deal. It's for real, guys. And news traveled fast. Jesus, Jesus healed Aeneas. And that had an amazing impact, obviously, for Aeneas. But, but, but that's not where Luke draws our focus to in the next verse. He brings our focus to the fact that it strengthened the church. It built up the church numerically. Loads of people in the city and in the whole region turned to the Lord. So the church is coming together with a strong witness to Christ, who he is, what he's done, his great power, that he's alive, that he is at work. And that is the effect that it has. Now, 12 miles or so west of Lydda, you've got the Mediterranean Sea and you've got the port town of Joppa. Now, although Joppa was in Judea, it was 
really, it had a, a very distinctively Greek characteristic. That was the dominant culture in Joppa at the time. The language was Greek. So it's very likely that there were obviously loads and loads of Greek Gentiles there. So you see, the gospel is now starting to reach towards the ends of the earth, the peoples of the earth. And it's a port town. It's a significant place. And in Joppa, there's this disciple, a well-known disciple called Tabitha. That's her Aramaic name. And being this very Greek city, she also goes by the name Dorcas, the Greek name Dorcas. And she had this reputation for being full of good works, full of charity. And once again, we see here in the book of Acts that generosity, that sharing, that, that, that freely giving is a sign of the Spirit's work in those whom Jesus has saved. She's a great disciple, well known. But, verse 37, in those days, Peter's been in the region for a while it seems, in those days, Tabitha became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Now, that is simultaneously kind of strange, but also completely wonderful. You see, it's strange in the sense that once you've washed a body, the next thing you do is, is bury it. You, you don't take it upstairs. It's not usual practice. But it's wonderful in that it tells us that the Christians in Joppa know something. They know something. They are confident. Firstly, they know that Peter is in Lydda. Remember how news spread of Aeneas' healing? Joppa's only 12 miles away. It's in the region. And secondly, they know that this apostle is doing the true works of an apostle. He is like Jesus in terms of power and ability and authority over things like disease and death. His miracles are endorsing him as the real deal and Christianity as the real deal. Not a sect, not a cult. Jesus Christ is alive. He is at work. The church really is the real thing. And so if the living power of Jesus is being seen and exerted through the apostles, being manifested through Peter, then of course Jesus can raise Tabitha from the dead. So the disciples go, well, let's just take her upstairs and send for Peter. And that's what they did. The fact that they no longer regarded death as the final word, the last word, just shows how much that the resurrection of Jesus has gripped those disciples there in Joppa. It's, run, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? So verse 38, since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. So you should try and work it out. It's, you've got a bit of guesswork going on here, but it's 12 miles. If the two men ran, it's hot, so let's give them three hours. If Peter walked with them, maybe six hours to get back. So what I'm saying is it's the same day, maybe. It's not unreasonable to think it's the same day. It could be the next day. Who knows? But it's still some time after she died. This is not a CPR thing. She has definitely died. They've washed the body. This will be a remarkable miracle. Now, it's quite significant that, that it's widows who are gathered there. Of course, Widows would have been probably among the primary recipients of the kindness and grace of Dorcas because uh, widows and orphans would have been the primary people through the charity, the acts of good works and, and arms would have been given to. And so they're really upset. They're gathered there, this dear woman, and they're, they're showing all of these garments that she produced for them to Peter. It's very moving, isn't it? That scene is really impassioned. They clearly loved this lady. So with the hope of resurrection in their hearts and with this devotion and love for this dear lady, they make the arrangements and it all comes together. 
And in this act, which is once again highly reminiscent of when Jesus healed Jairus' daughter, raised her from the dead, Peter puts the mourners outside, verse 40, and he kneels down and he prays. Now in Luke 8, we know that uh, Jesus dismissed all the mourners from the upper room in Jairus' house. Jesus dismissed them all, all apart from John and Peter. Peter's clearly following the pattern of his Lord here. Like with the healing of Aeneas, Luke is showing us that Jesus is still at work through his apostles. And not only is this miracle very similar to that one that, that Jesus performed in, in, uh, with Jairus' daughter, it's also really similar to one that Elijah performed in 1 Kings 17 and also Elisha in 2 Kings 4. There's this whole thing of like, when, when a resurrection is going to take place, go to the upper room. In both case, cases, the bodies were taken, there was prayer, there was a resurrection. And I think this is just that little link back again, just showing us the consistency. This Jesus is the Lord God of Israel. He is God. So Peter kneels down and he prays. He doesn't lay his hands on the body. He doesn't stretch himself over it like Elisha did. He simply prays and then speaks a word of command. And if he spoke that word of command in Aramaic which isn't unlikely, just as Jesus did with Jairus' daughter, he would have said, Tabitha, kumi. It's only one word different, isn't it? One letter different from what Jesus said to Jairus' daughter, Talitha, kumi. So at the word of command spoken to this body, she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. It's very gentle, isn't it? It's very, again, very moving. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And that wording, once again, he presented her alive, it sends our minds back to Jesus. Acts chapter 1 verse 3, that's the exact phrase that Luke uses to describe how it was that Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. He presented himself alive alive and in that instance it was it was proving to to them and, and testing out the reality of his resurrection body so here again here is an authentic jesus focused jesus like sign peter is preaching and he's also doing these great works like jesus this stuff is the real deal jesus is alive and as you'd expect, like with Aeneas, when somebody is resurrected like this, news spreads fast. And Luke, once again, is keen to stress how, how the impact was on the whole group of people, the whole church being strengthened. Many believed in the Lord. Many came to faith. It's amazing. Wonderful, wonderful, encouraging stories. Peter was such a great encouragement to the church, not because he did miracles, but because of who those miracles testified to, and even how he went about doing it. It was all about Jesus, all about witnessing to Jesus. And then the passage ends with that little comment that Peter's going to stay in Joppa with a guy called Simon, who is a tanner, not of the sunbed variety, uh, but the animal hide variety, you understand? Now, a, a devout Jewish person wouldn't stay at a tanner's house. All those animal skins meant that the tanner himself had been in contact with, with death and loads of dead animals, and so would have been ceremonially unclean, according to the law. So it's quite significant that Peter's staying there. We can see that the penny is just slowly starting to drop for him. He's getting to grips with the fact that, that the religious and ceremonial aspects of the law of Moses have been fulfilled by Christ. They don't apply anymore. Jesus is alive and he's fulfilled the law. So Peter is, is, is figuring out that we're, we're free from those religious ceremonial requirements of the old law. But of course, the big test for Peter is going to come in the next chapter when the more radical step of visiting a Gentile 
and, uh, and, and all that God has to say about food is going to really confront him for real. But for now, it's small steps. The gospel is breaking through. We're seeing the witness of Christ going out from Jerusalem all, to, all the way to the ends of the earth. The church is witnessing to the risen Jesus. The dividing walls are coming down. And all kinds of people in all kinds of places are now being added to the church. This was a, a, a scripture, a passage, all about the witness to Jesus Christ. And indeed, when that witness was made, that lots of people came and followed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So the way to encourage churches is to testify to Jesus. That's what Peter did, isn't it? And that's what we need to do as well. We can testify to Jesus. You and I, we can all do this. Testify to Jesus. Speak about his amazing life. The fact that the whole world, with all its sadness and all its brokenness, just kind of comes undone and untrue in the presence of Jesus. He's just this oasis of life. Wherever he goes, life just kind of flows and, and flows out to different people. He restores. He helps people. It's a great message of hope for our world, isn't it? Jesus brings life. Jesus makes sense of everything. Jesus has answers to all your fears, even death itself. Jesus is the one we need. I love the fact that the Christians in Joppa are so gripped by the resurrection that they do this for Dorcas. It's such a powerful testimony to, to Christ and his power over people and the hearts that he's created in them. These stories also show us that this is what church is all about too. That when we gather together, it's about us together kind of witnessing to Jesus, his life and all that he said, all that he's done, all that he, he, he will continue to do. The church witnesses to Christ for the sake of the lost. That's what we're for. That's what we are. When we gather, we should be this powerful witness to Jesus in word and in deed. So much so that when people hear it and they see it and they come in, that they, they want to confess Jesus as Lord for themselves, just like they did here. So these little stories, just ask a few questions of us. If we are Jesus' disciples here this morning, if we're convinced of his life, death, resurrection, and ascension, if we're convinced of those things, are we expecting new life when we gather? Are we expectant for resurrection? Because Jesus is present. Jesus is here right now. Jesus is present with his churches. He walks among the churches. And we are witnessing to him right now in his word and through our lives. We are witnessing to Christ. We are encountering Jesus. So are you coming expecting to see Jesus bring new life? Are you expecting an encounter with the risen Savior that leaves you changed? That you come in and you, you, you leave a different person to what you came in because the risen Christ has taken some piece of your life or something that you're thinking and he's, he's, he's corrected it or he's turned it round or he's shown you something. Are you coming expecting to be shown that there's no hope in this life and there is a great hope in the life to come? And the world to come. Because that loosens our grip on the things of this life, doesn't it? Makes us more like Dorcas. Makes us more generous. So are we expectant when we come to church to hear from Jesus? Have we, have we prayed ahead of time for the preacher? Have we read through the passage? Have we been in prayer for salvations? It was by prayer that new life came in this story. And we need to be in prayer for life. That's why we're here. To witness to Jesus, here in the ends of the earth, as it were, to the lost. 
We are God's people proclaiming Jesus. And it's not just about what happens in this pulpit. Obviously, preaching is a key part of what happens when we get together. We need to be taught. We need to be built up. We need to be shown what the Scripture says. The preaching needs to witness to Jesus. But it's not the only thing. How we love, like those widows. How we speak, like Steve was sharing earlier. How we welcome, how we share, how we give, how we suffer the little children. All of these are important aspects of of how we will witness to Jesus. Like him in word and deed. The church here in Acts 9 were doing as Jesus commanded. They were witnessing to him in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This good news about Jesus really is for everyone, everywhere. And maybe you've come in this morning, you're, you're curious about Jesus, you've heard about it and you, you, you're, you're interested to think, who is this guy? And you've seen and heard something of a witness of Jesus today. So my question is, what are you going to do about Jesus this morning? Jesus Christ is alive. And you can know the God of heaven today through Jesus. You've seen and heard of the things that Jesus does. Resurrection changes everything, doesn't it? You think about your own life. You think about where it's heading. Doesn't it change everything that Jesus rose from the dead, that he has the power and the keys of death? That changes everything, doesn't it? If you've never trusted Christ before, if you've never known his life, today he can bring you life, just like we see here. He can bring you life. The same Jesus who walked out of the tomb walks among us this morning. He is the king, and he can restore you to life. He can bring you into his kingdom today. And you know you can trust Jesus too, because Jesus, when he says, I am the resurrection and the life, that's kind of, anyone could say that, but no one can prove that unless they're God and they actually raise people from the dead. And that's what he does in his life, in his ministry on earth, and even after his ascension, he raises people from the dead. You can only do that if you are God, if you are divine. And Jesus, time and time again, proves he is who he says he is even after his ascension. So come to Christ. Come to Jesus. Find life in him. Find hope in Jesus. When you come to Jesus, you don't lose out. Being a Christian and coming to church is not lame. Death is lame. Having no hope is lame. Having to find your own identity and plow your own furrow through life, that's trudge that's hard that's that's lame because where does that field end how long do you keep trying to create an identity for yourself bow the knee and let Jesus give you an identity and a new name and a new life and a new heart turn to Jesus trust in him now if you've heard Jesus calling you today If you've heard his voice and you've seen something of his great power and you think, yeah, I want to know Jesus. I know that he's Lord because he does these things. I believe he rose from the dead. If you believe those things in your heart, you will be born again. And if you've believed that right now, maybe you just have. Praise the Lord. But tell someone, I believe in Jesus. I've got a new life from him today. Would you tell someone you came with? Be a huge encouragement to them. Come to Jesus.